and welcome to today's Chrissy B Show. And we are, of course, the UK's only program dedicated to your mental health and well-being. Now, parenthood is never easy at the best of times. There are many challenges, different phases of a child's life and lots of adjustments and patience needed. But things can get even more challenging when you find out your child has a disability. This is what happened to my real life story guest, Sarah Johnston, when her 13-month-old daughter was diagnosed with cerebral palsy. She was plunged into a world that felt completely alien to her, taking a toll on her mental, physical and emotional well-being. She also ended up being diagnosed with conditions of her own. Also on today's programme, we have our psychologist, Dr Audrey Tang, and her dog, Brandy. And they're going to be telling us about a brand new segment that we have on this programme called Test the Trend. Then we have on family coach Sharon Lawton explaining how a family can actually come together and be stronger when faced with a diagnosis. We also have nutritionist Hannah Richards showing us a healthy lunch in a jar. Then we also have another brand new segment for you called Dress Up and Never Give Up. And this is with Gabriella Demora, and she'll be speaking about how to rock a white outfit. And finally, we have on Dr. Rob Hicks answering your medical questions. But first of all, let's get straight to our first guest, Sarah Johnston. Welcome to the show, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you for the invite. So um, you've actually been through quite a lot with your daughter. You've, it was like a massive challenge that you faced when you found out that she had cerebral palsy. So can you tell us about how you found out first of all and then how you felt and what you went through? Okay, so Dana was term. She was three days late, actually, mm -hmm. and um, everything was fine. And then at 13 months, we had a visit from the health visitor, perfectly normal, yeah. and then she suddenly announced she's going to be referred to, to paediatric. And what happened then was um, we went to the appointment to, to mm. be told that Dana, my daughter, has cerebral palsy. Mm -hmm. And at that time, it was... Uh, I had, we hadn't been around disability, so we had no knowledge of what cerebral palsy was. Can you, t can you just explain quickly for the benefit of the viewers that don't Of know. course. I yeah. mean, cerebral palsy is an injury to the brain. Um, you can also develop cerebral palsy after meningitis. Oh, okay. um, so y there are lots and lots of different reasons yeah. you can actually get cerebral palsy. But in Dana's case, it was um, she was starved of oxygen at birth. Oh, um, okay. So she has um, triplegia, so um, which means it affects three limbs as opposed to four. Mm -hmm. Um, so her mobility is affected rather okay. than her cognitive skills. Right, okay. So we were just literally told, oh, by the way, your daughter has got cerebral palsy. How, how did you it. feel when you heard that news? Because you thought everything was fine and absolutely. And birth before that. Absolutely. And when we were told, it was pure shock. So shock probably wasn't a strong word. It was mm. denial. Um, they got it wrong, they don't know what they're talking about, so we had uh, went to Harley Street for a second opinion, because Harley okay. Street, surely, <laughs> yeah. they know what they're talking about. So went there, no, your daughter's got cerebral palsy. And it was devastating. It was suddenly your world in one second has just disappeared. Mm -hmm. The world that you'd known for all your life had disappeared, and suddenly you were thrown in this alien world that you knew nothing about. So you had no knowledge of cerebral palsy, so Google became our best <laughs> oh, friend, yeah, trying to, because we were given no information at all. Really? Nothing, nothing. And oh. what is sad is it's still happening now. Dana's 21, yeah. and it's still happening now. Parents are being told, yet they're expected to get on with it. That's so crazy. the therapies are in place for the child yeah. yet what happens to the parents who are then left mm. like in our case known living in one world and working in one world and suddenly being thrown in this alien mm. world that we know nothing about well how did you cope then 
this. Quite, um, on reflection, quite badly, okay. because it became yeah. a job for me. Yeah. And it, it, was, it was define everybody who told us she would never walk, she would never write, she wouldn't amount to much, and don't expect too much of her. And that, that, that was how she was meant to live her life. Yeah. Um, and it was, I took it on really badly because I, on retrospect, I made it my mission to defy everybody. Mm. So she did ballet, she did everything, she did acting, um, she was involved in everything. And she was wow. the only person in a ballet class with, with sticks, with a little tutu. So oh, birthday parties, we were on the climbing frames because I didn't want them to miss out on birthday parties. Yeah, the other mums were down talking, having a chat, and yet I was kind of up there because I wanted her to experience it. So That's there was amazing. nothing she didn't do. Yeah. Um, it did affect me tremendously. So there was bouts of depression. I was working at the same time as well. So juggling the two. So you had a huge amount on your shoulders, didn't absolutely. you? Absolutely. Yeah. So work became my haven, but I hid behind a label. So I hid behind my professionalism and I hid behind getting the job done. So that was my mantra. Did you not try to get any support from anywhere or were you just sort of living for your daughter and like... The support yeah. wasn't there, mm -hmm. so... What about speaking to friends the, and the, family? And that, see, that's an interesting one because mm -hmm. although you may have an, a big network around you, you feel very lonely mm -hmm. and very isolated mm -hmm. because you get really hurtful comments or people would cross the road Really? because they wouldn't know what to say, yeah, so yeah. they'd ignore you. Um, the school gates are the worst because you stand there and you know you're, the other mums are talking about you yet yeah, because you had to stand at a certain place yeah, to pick yeah. up your daughter. Nobody would come. So it was very, very isolated. And I think... So I became consumed with just getting her as independent, yeah. we went to Hungary when she was two to do conductive education, and that was that was quite hard. Um, but we threw everything, and when she was thirteen, we mm. found out about an operation in America that completely changed her life. Really? So what happened yeah. after that? Then how was she after so, that? So. Um, at, when we found out about it, we had to fundraise. So we fa fundraised £75,000 in six months, flew her to America, to a doctor we'd never met, mm -hmm. um, against everybody's advice not to go, um, health professionals. And she was out of a wheelchair and walking with oh, sticks. Yeah. So that actually defied what everybody's yeah. prediction of was of Would her. Would you say she's quite determined herself as well as Yeah, as herself, I think she got so. got that from you. <laughs> I think so, I think so. But because I you didn't set any limits on her. Maybe absolutely. everyone else did, but you were like, no, you can do this, you'll have to go ahead. Absolutely. Yeah. The thing is, no wasn't an option. If it was difficult to do at first, then yeah. you find another way. So even now, she finds a way, that's and amazing. it's incredible. And, and Dana doesn't see herself as disabled, and that's what's remarkable. Yeah. Sometimes to a detriment, because you think, how did you do that? Yeah. Yet she found she a way. She found a way. Yeah, absolutely. That's brilliant. So Sarah, let's talk about you now taking care of yourself, because obviously mm -hmm. you needed something to maybe throw yourself into to look after yourself too, because it was very demanding for you and it was a lot of pressure. So you got quite into fitness, didn't you? Can you tell us about that? Yeah, I, I think it got to a point where enough was enough, really, and I had yeah. to help myself. Yeah. Um, gone were the days of, you know, going to the doctors and saying, I'm depressed and, you know, yeah. uh, that wasn't going to help me. So um, I got back into fitness and I used to love the gym before I had oh, Dana. Okay. So I got back into fitness, um, I got into running, uh -huh. I did a 10K. Um, wow. which was great. Yeah. And what would you say, um, Sarah, to other parents maybe that have just found out that their, their child has a disability or a condition and they're like, I suppose, in shock as you were? Yeah. What, what advice would you give to them? I, I think the most important thing is to admit that you need help 
or mm. that you're not coping or you feel alone. I think so many times you have these feelings and you just ignore them yeah, and yeah. you dismiss them or you talk to somebody who perhaps is in a similar situation as you and they reinforce how you feel. You know, these support groups are great, yeah. but they keep you stuck. And I think mm. you just need to find someone that you can talk to openly who, you, who listens because yeah. you can hear, but you're not actually being listened to. Mm. And I think that's so and so important. And there yeah. needs to be something in place at a point of diagnosis. There's got yeah. to be, because it, it, we cannot have the same situation now as I had 21 years ago. That's unbelievable, that is. It's like, it's crazy, it doesn't make isn't it? Sense. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, maybe you could do something about that. <laughs> well, that's that's the work that I'm doing with mothers. Yeah, yeah. can you absolutely. tell us? Can you tell us a little bit about that as well? The work that you're doing. Yeah, and and this is really born out of me. Yeah. So because I know what it's like to suddenly have your world turned upside mm -hmm. down. So I work with mothers to reclaim their identity, their health, yeah. and their happiness to find them again to stop hiding behind labels and st to stop using their child as an excuse <laughs> because they are still people and they yeah. still need to live life Definitely. and be happy. Sarah, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, you amazing mum and parent. Thank you. And well done for everything that you've achieved and all the help that you're giving to others as well. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. OK, everybody, so after the break, we have on our psychologist, Dr. Audrey Tang, and her little dog, Brandy. And Audrey's going to be telling us about a brand new segment we're having on the show called Test the Trend. And we also have our family coach, Sharon Lawton, talking about how a family can come together and be stronger when faced with a diagnosis. So let's go inside and see what's happening. <laughs> everyone has problems right everyone goes through things but the important thing that we were trying to get across today is that you don't have to stay alone with those problems right you can open up and talk about them if you don't tell nobody you're keeping it inside and you're making yourself more worried absolutely fantastic dancing and stomping out those those emotions yeah, that was fun. I've been practicing in PE lessons for the warm-up, so they've been showing me some good dance moves. The Welcome back to today's Chrissy B Show, everybody. So now it's time to speak to Dr. Audrey Tang and also to the lovely Brandy. Hello, hey. Audrey and Brandy. Thank you for having us, Chrissy. <laughs> How are you, Brandy, my love? Oh, very good. Are you good? Wild. Look at this. Isn't she lovely? She is. So, She's Audrey, how long crazy. have you had Brandy? Um, I've had her now about eight years. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Yes. And can you tell us, of course, she's just come from quite a difficult past, hasn't she? She has, yes. We adopted her. One of the things that we wanted to do was adopt an older dog um, because we thought that a lot of people don't tend to want older dogs because they like puppies and they want to have them for a longer time and we thought we, since we've always had dogs we can have one and know that we can give it a good couple of years yeah, of their yeah. life um, and they said that Brandy was 10 when we got to the home because she looked very very scraggly very scrawny yeah. um, and we adopted her and took her to the vet just for a first checkup and the vet said oh no no I think I think she's five years old actually or she might even be three yeah. checking her teeth and so we've actually had her for much longer oh, than we expected wow. to and that's wonderful but yes she came from she was picked up as a stray and we were told to change her name and mm. also to avoid certain places around the area because they didn't want her previous owners finding her and picking okay. her up again mm. um we were also told to keep her away from chickens apparently she was tied up in some kind of chicken coop mm in the past. Yeah. Um, when we first brought her home, she was very timid. We noticed that she d doesn't like loud noises. She would grovel, so she'd run up to you and then be very, very low down on her, on her belly. And I think it was largely because she learned strategies to keep her safe from whatever the humans were yeah. doing. We also noticed that whenever my husband would walk by, she'd be okay, but if I walked near her, she'd flinch. 
And so we wondered whether it was perhaps the female the in female, the relationship yeah. that was that was uh, causing her the most fear. Um, she'd also hoard food. So when we put her food down to start with, she'd try and keep as much as she could because she wasn't sure when mm. the next feed would be. But of course, the more consistent you can be, the more you can just make sure that she knows she's always going to get fed, she's always going to get watered, then it eases okay. off. So even, even animals do go through trauma, don't they? They, they do, yeah. and they also learn strategies. They yeah, also yeah. learn ways of behaving that is going to keep them safe. And it took her a long time to find her bark again. It took her a long time to learn to play. But now, she I mean, she she's half asleep now. Yeah. She's, but very, she's, she's very comfortable. She is. She's very trusting of people still, which is amazing. And I think that's wonderful. She's very good around other dogs. And she's an absolute joy to have around. She's lovely. And actually, she's very friendly. I know you said, you know, before she used to be quite afraid if you walked past, yeah. but she, I didn't see any of that in her now, which means you've done a great job with her. <laughs> Thank and you. And it's so nice that she's actually found a nice family and moved on. It's, it's just so goes to show, it's what we talk about on the programme, isn't it? No matter what your past, it doesn't yes. mean that you can't be happy. If it's if it can apply for a lovely doggy like Brandy, imagine for us human beings. Well, this is the thing. There's that lovely saying of, it, you know, adopting a dog, it won't change the world, but the dog's world yeah. will be changed forever. And I yeah. think that's absolutely true. So okay. that's, that's wonderful. Now, there's another reason we we'll have Brandy on yes. today's show, because we're starting a brand new segment called that's Test right. Test the Trend. Can you tell us about yes, that? Yes, yes. Now, this is something which um, has been inspired by a lot of the features on your show. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, the social media one. One of the ideas behind Test the Trend is is we are given so much information nowadays. It's a quick fix for this, a miracle yeah. cure for that. We should do this, do that. This causes this problem, that causes that. And really, unless we stop and think, we don't actually know what's going to suit us, what's going to suit our lifestyle, yeah. what's going to work for us. And because life is moving so quickly, we end up wanting to take the next quick fix without really thinking about yeah. whether it's going to work. And testing the trend is all about returning to critical thinking, returning to taking some proactive um, control over our own lives. So what great. we're doing is we're looking at some of the most uh, popular things, for example, um, recycling, which is important, yeah. but uh, just as an example, this is little Brandy's involvement, as you can hear her purring, um, is, is I found out that pet owners, although they recycle a lot of things, they don't recycle cans of pet mm. food, which are recyclable. Yeah. So, um, what we're doing is we're looking at different trends, different um, fashions, different things that people are up to, yeah. and we're trying them out for a week and seeing, thinking about whether this really works, whether this fits into our lifestyle, whether it's something that is just a bit of a phase, a bit of a fad, or whether okay. it's something that's that really actually it's worth bringing into our lives. Okay. And the first one you've actually done is orthosomnia. Orthosomnia, yeah, yes. Which we're yeah. going to be showing soon on the programme. Yes, very exciting. Which and that's corrective was, sleep. Corrective right? sleep. It's an interesting one purely because one thing that's being presented a lot now to counsellors, to coaches, is people saying, I'm not getting perfect sleep because my tracker is saying it's, I'm not. And so I wanted to find out yeah, whether it is actually possible to get perfect sleep according to our tracker or yeah. whether we ought to really be listening to our bodies. Yeah, so you're going to be seeing Audrey and Brandy very soon, testing the trend for us and letting us know what they came up with. Audrey, thank you so much. Pleasure. Thank you so much, Brandy, and we'll see you very soon Yay. on Test the Trend. Thank you. <laughs> okay, everybody. So now it's time to speak to our family coach, Sharon Lawton, on how a family can come together and be stronger when faced with a diagnosis. Welcome to the show, Sharon. Hi, Chris. So you're going to be helping the families out there today, Sharon. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if a family is faced with some kind of diagnosis, whether physical, mental, anything like that, mm -hmm. how can the family actually come together and work together so they, they can be stronger? Because many times problems can tear a family apart. Mm, absolutely. Um, I think it's really difficult news to hear that your child has been given a diagnosis. Mm -hmm. um, and each parent and each sort of extended member of the family will be dealing with it in their own way. And of course, there is that sort of real gap between the excitement and the expectation of what life was going to be like yeah. and trying to sort of 
come to terms with or reflect on um, how life is going to be going forward. Um, and as a result of that, there will be a whole range of feelings and emotions going on because it's almost like a grieving for um, the life that could have been, yeah. uh, the child that could have been, you know, what, all those sort of what ifs. So I think for me, it's really important, you know, to sort of ensure that those lines of communication are, are kept open because, uh, as I say, everyone will be dealing with things very differently. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the mum will be dealing with things perhaps very differently from, from the dad. Um, if there are siblings involved, extended family, that type of thing. So okay. I think it's important to just to keep those lines of communication yeah. open and, and, to, and to not have any expectations about how people should yeah. be dealing with yeah, things. That's very important. And what do you think parents can do mm. themselves? Well, I think uh, it depends on the diagnosis, of course. Mm. Um, there's a fantastic poem out there, actually, that I wanted to share with your viewers. It's called um, Welcome to Holland. Um, and um, if any person out there has just received a diagnosis or actually already have, has a diagnosis um, of their child, yeah. it's a great one to read. It's a, it's a fantastic poem. Um, but I have brought along some other sort of more sort of practical things. As you know, yeah. I'm sort of all for strategies and, and practical things. I thought things. you were going to tell us a poem, like to read the poem to us or something. <laughs> It takes a little bit, you know, it's, oh. it's a little bit of a long one, so, oh, but okay. I would really, you know, if you just Google Welcome to Holland, it will come okay, up. It's a very, right. very sort okay. of well-known one. All right, it's fantastic. Go check that one out. So check that out, <laughs> that's fantastic. Um, but it's about being proactive. I mean, yeah. in my experience, parents uh, with children with diagnosis tend to become sort of an expert in their child's condition. Mm -hmm. um, there will be lots of organisations out there, you know, some are better than others. Um, but in my experience, the help doesn't sort of fall in your lap. You have to actively seek it out, which seems unfair, but it, yeah. unfortunately, yeah. that's the case and things haven't really changed. Um, so actively seeking out help um, and, you know, looking for that support and not refusing it because parenting is challenging enough. But when you are parenting a child with a diagnosis, actually, that comes with even more of its sort of unique challenges. So seeking out active help, looking for support groups and support networks of people who are going through something similar, maybe with a similar diagnosis, okay. people you can laugh with, yeah. people you can cry with, you know, that type of thing that people sort of gets it. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And certainly stay away from negativity and, and sort of toxic people. There yeah. will be a lot of people out there trying to tell you how you should be doing things, you know. Well, as we heard from the guests earlier, comments like that they're not going to amount to much, they don't expect too much. Oh, and all absolutely. Kind of and that's really, really unhelpful yeah. because because each, each young child, um, each child with a diagnosis, each person will have their own unique sort of strengths. Mm -hmm. um, and it's about yeah. celebrating the small wins, yeah, actually. Um, but some other things, really, um, for parents, some, some parents that I've worked with have, have actually found that things like um, a journal, this is an example of a, of a journal, mm -hmm. um, which are really, this is a lovely sort of one that, that I've used. That is um, and just to sort of, you know, to put down thoughts and sort of feelings, emotions, maybe um, sort of some emoji or a thought of the day you know or, or just sort of how you're feeling so yeah. that can be really helpful for people to sort of reflect um, mm -hmm. on um, but also um, giving the whole family an opportunity to be able to communicate their feelings and emotions maybe by using sort of um, uh, well, I've got an example yeah. here, actually. Wonderful. So sort of um, feelings charts. So they, yeah. these can be lovely. Sort of using sort of feelings charts so that if you're not able to verbalise how you feel, mm -hmm. well, actually, all the people in the family can actually show how they feel by, you know, just maybe pointing or, or moving up and down okay. um, the feelings um, thermometer. Um, so that's that one. And there's just another example here. Just one you can see this is the sort of a little picture on this is one that we use with my son actually he hasn't got a diagnosis but um, yeah. just around emotional regulation which was really helpful for us okay. all as a family so there's a sort of a couple of examples um, there which are, are really helpful um, as I say just finding a good support network is really important for parents okay what else do you think kids can do themselves if they are going through something and they're, they're worried and yeah maybe I, I, they want to do something more maybe okay so I guess it depends on whether it's the child with a diagnosis or the siblings because I mean yeah. we have to consider siblings if they're siblings involved um, and um, sometimes siblings can sort of get lost along the way um, so it is important for that sibling to maybe have some one-to-one -one time with the parent yeah. mm -hmm. I think sort of going back to parents one of the things I probably should have said was that often uh, parents will um, leave their own needs 
to, to last and actually for them to be able to really be able to support their child with the diagnosis then they need that self-care. Yes, self-care is really really important mm -hmm. but the same with children as well so looking for their own emotional needs that's why things like the um, uh, feelings charts to yeah. sort of teach self-regulation. Here's another example of just sort of a, a little sort of notebook to, you yeah. know, just to share thoughts and feelings and that type of thing. Again really important for young people to have a good support network. Yeah. People that they can talk to and that's the child with a diagnosis and siblings yeah. as well okay. so you know having that support network it is really really important and I've brought along something very special yes what's in the box so what's <laughs> in the box so this is a really really special this is um, you know I use this a lot with uh, children I work with that mm. uh, you have as maybe a diagnosis around emotional regulation but actually it can be used for any Anyone, child, yeah. really. Mm -hmm. So very, very special. Would you like to see what's inside? Yes, I would. Lots of things inside. <laughs> so um, inside my box, this can be used as sort of like a, a feeling safe box, okay. a happiness box, or a calming box. So it can be used for lots of things. Okay. And inside is just a whole selection of different things that um, the, the young person can find sort mm -hmm. of helpful okay. um, in dealing with the big feelings that come with a particular diagnosis or living in our house hold with the diagnosis okay so the things that I've got in here are this one here which I absolutely love so this is just a mini version of um, a calming jar that is like I used to love those when yeah I was a, kid, a little bit like yeah. a snow globe yeah that's it you know you sort of sort of talking about how our feelings get all shook up inside, yeah. which is which is really lovely. So that can be quite calming for a child just to sort of sit and sort of watch yeah. that with the glitter to settle. I've also got some sort of um, sort of tangle toys, some um, mm -hmm. sort of sort of playing with them to sort of like, you know, maybe focus or sort of calm big feelings. Mm -hmm. um, there are also some cards in here, which are again really lovely. Just around strategies on how I deal with big feelings. Okay. Yeah. Um, and obviously it's very unique to different the different diagnoses to be honest. Mm -hmm. So and the final one just yeah. to sort of show you in here yeah. is is the feather. <laughs> because breathing techniques are important yeah. just to self-regulate and keep calm. But anything can go in the box, really, sort of around yeah. um, helping Such children. Such a good idea, stuff, really good. So, yeah. Wonderful. Fantastic. Shout out, my darling. Thank you so much. Oh, always a pleasure. And we'll see you again very soon. I look forward to it, Chris. <laughs> Thank you. OK, everybody, so after the break, we're going to be going to our nutritionist, Hannah Richards, for a healthy recipe and lunch in the jar. Hi, I'm Chrissy B, host of the UK's only TV programme dedicated to mental health and well-being, The Chrissy B Show, which airs on my TV Sky 191 every Monday, Wednesday and Friday. Follow our social media on YouTube, Instagram and Twitter at Chrissy B Show and our Facebook page, The Chrissy B Show. For more information, visit chrissybshow.tv. Welcome back to today's Chrissy B Show, everybody. So now it's time to go to Hannah Richards' kitchen and she'll be showing us a healthy lunch in a jar. Hello and welcome to the Chrissy B Show. My name's Hannah Richards and today I'm going to show you two different lunches that you can take with you in utensils that you've already got hanging out in your kitchen that you probably didn't know you had. I'm talking about jam jars. There is so much that we buy in our supermarket um, and from different shops that come in jars. And jars have lids which make them perfect containers for carrying around your food uh, for lunch or for breakfast or for snacks. Don't throw them out. I'm going to show you how you can uh, make a salad, make a fruit salad, use all your fruit and vegetables that maybe you don't know what to do with to their best advantage and for your best nutrition. So let's get started. So the first two ingredients I'm going to use are broccoli and I haven't dyed it, it's a purple cauliflower. Now with plant food and plant recipes on the rise, this is going to be a plant based lunch. Um, so first of all, all I'm going to do is just snap off the uh, florets of broccoli from the main stalk. 
Now broccoli and cauliflower have really high amounts of water in them. So the first thing we're going to do, I'm not going to cook any of this, I'm just going to make a dressing and let it marinate in the dressing so that the broccoli and the cauliflower naturally become a little bit softer. Raw food is great for you, but remember that if you don't have the digestive capabilities or you're a little bit digestively challenged, then raw food can be quite hard. And so if you're eating a lot and feeling bloated, that might be the reason why. So with the cauliflower, just take off the cauliflower leaves and by all means do not throw these guys away. They are perfect when you're frying an onion or a leek. Um, they're, they're just chop them really, really small and fry them as the base of whatever you're making in your, uh, in your frying pan with your coconut oil or your olive oil or whichever oil you're using. So we're going to put them, use them to the side, use them for later. And again with your cauliflower, just pull away the, fl the flowers and cauliflower breaks down to smaller bits in a minute, you'll see. Look at that beautiful colour. Okay. And that's going to be the base um, of our salads. So now I'm just going to show you how to make a really fiery metabolic uh, dressing. You're going to need some olive oil. Um, so just plunge a bit of olive oil into a jug. You're going to need a lemon. You could use a lime as well. It's always nice to get the flesh of everything that you're squeezing or using because it adds another texture to the to, to your creation. Um, so don't be scared that the flesh of the lemon or the lime comes in. It just adds to it. Then I'm going to use uh, some turmeric. That's the really bright orange root. Looks like a little knobbly finger. So thinly slice your turmeric and then you can give it a, a finer chop on the board. And the moment you start cutting into turmeric, you can start smelling the vibrancy and freshness of it. The only, the only problem is it will stain your fingers. Oops. There we go. So then I'm going to use some ginger. Uh, ginger is stronger in uh, potency than turmeric. So if you're, so just be careful with the amount of ginger that you use. I'm just going to uh, peel the ginger. So take the outer layer off and then I'm just going to take a few peels. Now this uh, peeler is a julienne peeler so immediately you get the little strips. So in they go into the dressing. So my last ingredient is a big red chilli just to give everything a bit of extra spice. You don't need too much of this guy. I'm just going to keep it simple and just very finely again cut that chilli down. There we go. Last little bit into the pot. Then I'm going to add some vinegar. I've got some cider apple vinegar. Give it a good shake because the sediment always rocks down to the bottom. There we go. And give it a little stir again. 
Now the thing with dressings is that you've got to keep, you've constantly got to be tasting. Because if it's too oily, then it's you, you're going to lose. If you put too much oil in, you're going to lose all the beautiful ingredients from the chili and the turmeric and the ginger and the lemon. So I'm going to pour the dressing all over the cauliflower and the broccoli just to help it soften a little bit. There we go, almost looks like a dish by itself. I'm gonna put that to the side and let it soak up all the wonderful juices. So now I'm gonna get my uh, jam jar. So take the biggest jam jar you can find in your house and we're gonna start layering it. So a little bit earlier, I baked a sweet potato. So I'm gonna grab it out of the oven and start with that. So this was quite a big sweet potato. And you can, you know when sweet potatoes are done because they, they'll, they'll be blist, they'll feel like they're blistering. And you should just be able to take the skin off and be left with the sweet potato there. If you're having to struggle and the skin hasn't blistered away, then it's not, it's gonna be a little bit hard. But this is a perfect example of um, how it should be. It's still a little hot and you should just be able to Pull it all away like that. Perfect. So then I'm just going to cut per uh, diced, sorry, disc size. So I'm going to start layering my salad. I'm going to start with some vine tomatoes. Tomatoes on the vine always taste better than tomatoes off the vine. I always do recommend people to eat organically as well because all the food that's grown organically gives us information and it's that information in the food that helps our cells grow and flourish. Um, food isn't just fodder, it, it heals us and it makes us who we are. It improves our mental health when we are eating food that's from the earth, that hasn't been sprayed in pesticides and chemicals, and it helps our physical health and a regeneration of all the cells that we have. So if you are gonna spend your money, spend it on organic, seasonal, and local food, because you'll be a healthier person for it. And a lot of the time people say, if you don't take time now to be well, you'll have to take time later to be sick. So it's worth getting your food right. There we go, there's the first layer, bright red tomatoes. Then I'm gonna take some blueberries. These are British blueberries and they're really sweet. I'm gonna give that a, this jar a layer of blueberries. And you can decide on anything, all your favorite foods you could put in this jar. I'm then going to take a little bit of green because you always need some green on your plate. This is watercress. And I'm just going to pack that down a little bit. Then I'm going to go back to our cauliflower and broccoli that we uh, marinated with our metabolic dressing a little bit earlier. And it's, you've just got to get your hands in and I can feel the broccoli already getting a little bit softer in there. So I'm going to start layering that up. I'm going to take the smallest bits that I can find of the flowers and just take them around the jar. This is purple cauliflower. And you're just layering as you go. There we go. And then I'm going to not waste any of that dressing and just pour it down and through so that every, all of our vegetables and fruit 
get a flavoring. And then I'm gonna top it off with some sweet potato. And again, just pack it down. Grab your lid, any little do. And there you've got a plant-based lunch, no food wastage, no plastic, looking after the planet, looking after your gut, ready to eat, ready to put in your bag. What could be simpler? Thank you very much to Hannah there. So after the break, we have Dress Up and Never Give Up with Gabriella Demora, and she's going to be telling us about how to rock a white outfit. And we also have your questions answered by Dr. Rob Hicks. So the reason that we did the dance, through the dance, I wanted to actually show the fight against depression. The dance is so symbolic. Waving the flags, I think it's like saying to your worries, go away and don't come back. I did like the dance and everything. <laughs> For example, this move. Does anyone know what this one means when you do that? The compression out and all the sadness out and like all the scariness out. Welcome back to today's Chrissy B Show, everybody. So now it's time for Dress Up and Never Give Up with Gabriella, and she's speaking about how to rock a white outfit. Hello, everyone. I'm Gabriella, and I'm here on Chrissy B Show, and today I'm going to be showing you guys the look I wore on my last weekend. I'm here in Spain and it's super hot, right? So I got with you guys and I got for you a summer outfit. My trip, like my short trip I have done here in Madrid. It's beautiful around here and it's super hot. So I got to wear like some really light outfit and white. White really matches with summer. And white also can match with many things. And when I went there, I didn't have a hat. So I saw a hat on the street, it was really cheap, really good price. So I thought to wear it and to complement my outfit. It's really summer. So you can wear with a hat and without, but I think a hat can really complement your look. So a hat can really go well with everything. I also will show next week some uh, outfits to wear with hat, with denim, everything look really nice. For some it's beautiful. I love hats. The all white look that I have, that uh, I wore that day, it was in the daytime, as you can see. I wore with flats, even with this bag, with the same bag. But then if you want to go in the night for dinner, to go out with your friends, you also can change just some accessories and you are ready to go out in a, in a place where you need to dress up more. You can remove the hat, you can keep the bag or you can put another bag, a colorful bag, bag but yet maintain everything white. I have here some shoes. This is a really different shoes. I love these shoes. I didn't wear it yet. But it's really nice. You can maintain everything white, but then with heels, when it's really pointy, it gives you more height and make you even look uh, more tall. And when you put a pointy shoes, really looks like you're really dressed up. I have this beige one as well. It's my friend Nikki who gave me these shoes. I love it. And uh, that's it. I'm gonna be showing you the pictures for the the same look, but you um, showing an option that you can go in the night. Okay, so as I always say, dress up and never give up. Don't go by what you feel. Open your cupboard, see what you have and start trying. This is a full white outfit. And you can, I'm sure you have something white, start trying with your skirt, even if it's a dress, you can 
accessorize it and make it look really nice. It's super hot in Madrid. I don't know where you are if it's hot, but it's, this is a really nice tip for the summer. Even when winter is coming, you can wear everything white, matching with checks like a um, print. Looks really nice. Okay, I hope you have liked it. And if these tips have helped you, send us the picture because I want to see your look as well and that can inspire us, okay? Big kiss to you. Thank you very much to Gabriella there. So now it's time to head over to Dr. Rob Hicks to answer your medical questions. Hello and welcome to Doctor's Answers. I'm Dr. Rob Hicks. And if you want to send me a question, then the email address is doctor at chrissybshow.tv. Can't wait to get more of your questions. So let's crack on with today's program's questions. And the first one is about hay fever tablets and medication. It says, is it safe to take expired hay fever tablets, eye drops and nasal sprays? I have some left over and I don't want to waste them or spend more money on new ones if I don't have to. I think that's a very reasonable question and the simple answer is no. Um, you shouldn't take any medication that's gone past its expiry date for a couple of reasons. One is it may not be safe to do so and the other is that the medication may not be as effective. So well done for actually checking the expiry dates. We should all check our medication expiry dates before we take any medication to make sure that they're still within date and, it, and that it's okay to take. And a little note of, of warning, don't get rid of expired medication by throwing it in the bin or flushing it down the toilet. Take it back to your pharmacist so that he or she can dispose of it safely. Now with regards to hay fever, it's a good idea to start taking any medication that you use, whether that be tablets, a nasal spray or eye drops, a month or so before you're likely to get your symptoms. So give your body a chance to be prepared for when it's faced with the onslaught of pollen. And think about how you avoid pollen in the first place when it's around. So wrap around sunglasses, for example, very, very good at protecting the eyes from pollen. Using a nasal balm that you smear around the entrance to the nostrils, that should catch the pollen and stop it from getting into the nose where it can trigger allergy responses. Um, and if you keep an eye on the pollen forecast and the pollen count is going to be very high on that day, ideally, if you can, stay indoors with the windows closed. If you have to go out, then make sure when you come back in that you strip off your clothes, have a shower and wash your hair. And that way you won't be dispersing pollen around your home where it can later cause you problems. So our next question is, I get the odd nosebleed when the weather is hot. Is this anything to worry about? Well, probably not. It's probably nothing to worry about because most of us get a nosebleed every now and then. And what triggers them is either some damage to the lining of the, the nostrils or when there's a change in the lining of the nostrils. So in your case, it might be because of the hot weather, your nostrils are getting dried out. And we know that if they get dried out, they're more likely to you know, develop it, uh, nosebleeds. Trauma, well, it's picking the nose and blowing the nose too hard that's usually responsible. I would say to you, though, if you are getting them on a regular basis, it wouldn't be a bad thing to have a checkup with your GP because sometimes nosebleeds can occur because of somebody's having high blood pressure, or it might be because they've got a problem with the clotting mechanism within their blood, or it might be because you're on a medication, something that thins the blood, an anticoagulant like warfarin, for example, where nosebleeds are far more likely. But it sounds to me that you've got a pattern where in high temperatures, um, the, the, the nosebleed occurs. And that's probably because the, the nasal lining is getting dried out. So what you can do is actually keep the, the nostrils moist by using a salt water nasal spray and humidifying any room that you're, you're in. And that, that way you may find, and hopefully you'll find, you're less likely to suffer nosebleeds. But I would say to you that if they're happening on a frequent uh, occurrence and you can't really pinpoint what's causing them, get it checked out. Now it's time to get back to you, Chrissy. Thank you very much to Dr. Rob Hicks there. And if you have a question that you would like answered, please do email us on doctor at chrissybshow.tv. 
So I'd like to thank all my guests on today's programme, especially to Sarah for sharing her story about the struggles she went through when her daughter was diagnosed with cerebral palsy. And something that she'd like to highlight from her story are the negative words that she heard from people. Now, many times, unfortunately, there are people that say certain things. Sometimes, I would say probably less often, people say things spitefully and in order to hurt another human being. But many times, things are said quite innocently because maybe people don't want to kind of give you false hope or anything like that. So perhaps people might say to you, say if you have a child that's been diagnosed with something, don't expect too much from your child. Um, things might not get very better or much better or you're always going to have this uh, mental health condition for the rest of your life. Don't expect anything much. Um, you know, don't expect to achieve so much. People sometimes say these things because they themselves don't believe it's possible to recover or for example, if it's to do with your child, for your child to achieve much because they've been diagnosed maybe with this physical condition or a mental health condition. People say things and it's really, really important that you don't take that on board as necessarily the truth. Now, I'm not saying that you should disregard what your doctors say, what you know your counsellor says, no. But of course, you have to kind of also think for yourself. Even if, for example, say a professional says to you, there's no cure for this, there's nothing that can be done, you know, you're gonna to have to manage this condition for the rest of your life. But then how come there are people that have completely recovered from certain things? What was different about them? It just goes to show that there are also and always those that can recover. I, for, I, for example, am, am an example of someone that recovered completely from mental health issues. Um, there are other people that, for example, were told that they would never walk again, that actually are walking and they are running and they're doing sports. So we can't just sort of say, you know, listen to someone else say it's, it's impossible. Okay, it's impossible for them. It doesn't mean that it's impossible for you. So what do you think? What do you believe? Do you believe that you can recover? Do you believe that um, your child, for example, can achieve lots of things despite a diagnosis? So you kind of have to take things with a pinch of salt sometimes. Yes, you listen to advice, you get the advice from the professionals, everything like that. Um, advice from professionals always very valid. You have well-meaning friends, well-meaning family, but don't think that's the be all and end all. There is always a way. There's always something that we can do better with or you know, other, other ways to get help. It's not the be all and end all just because someone said, this is it for you or this is it for your child. So always remember that what's What's impossible for them isn't necessarily impossible for you. Well, everyone, we have reached the end of today's programme, but if you have a story that you would like to share, please do get in touch with us by emailing info at chrissybshow.tv. You can also tweet or Instagram us at chrissybshow or leave a message on our Facebook page, The Chrissy B Show. If you'd like to know more about my mental health journey and the things that I went through in the past but also recovered from, you can visit my personal website, which is mylifeafterdepression.com. Till next time, bye for now.